where we're at. We are at this point where we have our ship, we have a game engine that's with something that shoots bullets, and we want to get asteroids in here. Um, before I move on, I just want to also correct the player shooting interval, because if you guys are going to need this for homework, I want to make sure that you have something that shoots at a regular interval. Um, so we can re-implement that behavior pretty easily here um, inside our player. We just have a weapon cooldown variable. The only real difference is where this variable lives, whereas before it lived on the function for main, and here now it will live on the player. And in player, what we're going to do is we're going to initialize this variable to zero inside the constructor, inside the member initialization list here. And then here we're going to take weapon cooldown and subtract dt. And then we're only going to do this behavior if weapon cooldown is less than or equal to zero. That's the only case we're actually going to check for input. And if we actually detected that your key was pressed, we're going to reset this thing to be 0.2. Okay? So we just re-implemented that weapon cooldown behavior, but we just moved it into the player's ship. So now when I'm pressing spacebar, at least now it'll shoot at a pretty, um, it won't be shooting all the time. It'll be shooting 0.2 seconds. All right. So I want to get an asteroid in here. The pattern is going to be very similar to how I create an asteroid or how I create a player. So I'm actually going to just duplicate the player. You can also duplicate the bullet if you want to. Create an asteroid. Um, you can take a texture path here. I don't, it doesn't really matter if you pass one in or not. Uh, however, in this case, I want to try some, some different things with having the asteroids be there. And really, I'm just going to have an asteroid here. I'm not going to have a weapon cooldown. It really just has a constructor. And this constructor here, <coughs> which is going to be put into game objects at the bottom, I'm going to put a little separator in between that and my game objects. Um, you have to call the parent constructor for a game object here. And then now we have an asteroid, and we can pass in the image that we want to have. So I'm going to create an asteroid. And I'm going to pass in sprites, PNG, meteors. Like so. There's my, there's my asteroid. I'm going to put it kind of here, in the top left. And then I'm going to call Unreal Engine 6 add object asteroid. This is going to add one asteroid. I asked for five, and I asked for them also to eventually be randomly of different size, but there's our asteroid here. Cool. So let's do this five times. And without having it be random to start, we can just adjust the spawn position here. I'm just going to add i times 100 into the position. I'm going to get five angle, five asteroids in an angle like so. Okay. So I want these things to be randomly spawned, not just based on here. So we can do that too. We can call srand. Like so. There is a shorthand version of this too, if you ever want to. Just do. If you want, if you don't mind warnings, this will be okay. Um, but I usually don't mind warnings. I, I, I mind warnings. So I have my C to randomizer. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this variable. I'm going to add 100 to it. I'm going to rand it by um, I don't know modulo 1000. And then I'm going to take this guy 100 plus rand modulo. <coughs> So kind of keep it away from the edges, and we'll spawn five kind of randomly around the screen every time. Cool. All right. So we have our five asteroids. I want to make some of these asteroids small and some of them big. So if I think about it, I could just change the image that's passed in. But what I really want is I want to add the concept of collision. Each of these asteroids, if they're big or small or medium sized, will have a different collision radius. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to create a few new classes that derive from asteroid. So asteroid itself is going to be the, the base class for my derived classes. So I'm going to make something called a large asteroid here. And I'm going to make something called a small asteroid here. And these are not going to take a texture path. These are just going to take a position. These are two new classes I've created. And I'm only going to create constructors for these guys. So I'm going to create a constructor for large and a constructor for small asteroid as well. So I'll put this down here. 
And all they're going to do is call the asteroid version of the constructor. And I'm going to pass in the path to the texture that I created here, like so, passing in the position as well. And what this is going to let me do is going to let me change the asteroid. So let me change the image that's used for the asteroid. So in this case, I have small. I know that I have a tiny, or I have a small PNG. So I can use that one here. And I need to make sure that when I have these, these aren't derived off game object, they're derived off asteroid instead. So large and small asteroids are both types of asteroids. And I'm going to make these all be small to start, just to prove that that works. So I'm going to create small asteroids. I'm going to create five of them. So I have five tiny asteroids. Or I can create large asteroids. Notice I'm not passing in a path to the texture here. The texture path is, in, is specified in the constructor for the asteroid itself. So now what I can do is I can put a condition here into what kind of asteroid I spawn. So I can put a if rand flip a coin. And my coin flip is literally just this if statement that modulus is by 2. And if equal to 0, then that means it's a, that it's a uh, even or odd number. So depending on if the random number I generated is even or odd, I will generate half of them be large and half of them be small. Not always. I mean, it's not perfectly random, obviously. So sometimes you're going to get more, sometimes you're going to get less. But uh, in this case here, I seem to be getting a pretty good random distribution. Okay. So a bunch of asteroids here. Great. Okay, any questions about this, getting the asteroids in here? All right, let's talk about collision detection. Going back to my wonderful image that I had. Every one of these guys has a radius. How do we do collision detection? Well, the way this works is if your radius is overlapping with someone else's radius, you're considered colliding. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to go through and ask each player, each object, to see if you are colliding with anything else. And then once you are colliding, we're going to ask to see if you should care about that or not, based on if you're an asteroid or if you're a bullet. As we mentioned, bullets and players both care about asteroids, but asteroids don't care about each other. So let's add that behavior. So first things first, I want to have a collision radius on the game object. So if I go to, if I go to my game object.h and go to my game object class, I'm going to add a new float that represents the radius of collision for my object. And then I'm going to add a function that lets me set that. In this case here, I'm just going to remind you that you can also inline this function. You don't have to write this function inside the CPP. You can write it right here if you want to, like so, by putting it, the code within braces. You can also do this on separate lines if you want to, like so. Okay. You can put this in the header if you want to. I tend to shy away from doing that, but uh, for one line, things like this is typically OK. Here's what I'm going to do. I want to draw this collision radius. I want to set this collision radius on a bunch of my objects, like the player and the asteroids and the bullets. And I want to see what they look like. I want to see the size of these things. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set a collision radius for the player. I don't know, let's say 40, like so. And then Inside my game object, when I go to draw, I have this function for drawing. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create a circle shape that represents the collision radius. And I'm going to set the collision, uh, I'm going to call this collision shape. I'm just going to draw it. I'm not going to do anything other than just draw it. But I am going to set the radius to be the radius that I have for my collision radius. And I'm going to ask the window to draw this collision shape too. Oh, and the other thing too, we need to set the position to be the player position. And we need to set the origin here to be the the collision radius as well. And let's set the color here to be and set an outline color to be magenta. You want a magenta? All right. Uh, then we'll set the outline thickness to be like three, okay, and we'll set the set fill color 
Okay, there's a lot of things here, but I'm, I'm basically filling it to be transparent, giving an outline, and making sure it's in the right place. And then I'm going to draw this for every shape. So when I move my player around, you can see this like magenta colored circle that corresponds with my collision radius. I'm not doing any logic, I'm literally just drawing it right now. It looks a little small to me. Typically in shooters though, you tend to favor it being a little bit on the smaller side, but you can see here, as I adjust the size of the collision radius, maybe I make this thing a little bit bigger, it'll make my, the circle of the magenta encapsulate the entire ship. Okay. I'm going to go back to making it be a little bit smaller. I want to favor being a little smaller size just so you can weave in and out a little bit. So as long as you're like, your wingtips can clip an asteroid and that's okay and that feels a little fair. But your player itself cannot. So let's add a collision radius now. As long as we go through and we set this collision radius, let's say on the asteroids, like the large asteroid, let's set this collision radius to be 50. And let's set the small ones to be like 20. So I'm setting collision radius now. Anything that has a collision radius should draw on there. You guys can see now that those things also have collision radiuses, so it looks kind of like this, right? And bullets, too. Uh, so there's no purple thing around bullets, so let's make those draw, too. So we need to just set a collision radius on the bullets as well. And the bullets are going to be kind of small. So you can see there's purple circles around those things, too. Now, I'm eventually going to remove this drawing of the collision radius because I don't want our game to be magenta. But it's a good way to visualize what's going to be happening. Okay? So let's write the code that tells us that we are colliding with one another. So what I'm going to do is, inside the game engine update, this is where we're going to go over all the objects in our list. So as we're going through and we're calling update on them, what I want to do is I also want to ask if an object is colliding with something else. So what I'm going to do is, remember how I went through this list with two arrows? I started with Gary. So here's Gary. And then I'm going to go through every other object in this list, and I'm going to see if they collide. Then I'm going to repeat that for every object in the list. This behavior is going to be nesting two loops together. Okay? So I'm going to take this loop, and I'm going to duplicate it one more time inside the other loop. But I am going to update these variables. Instead of being i, I'm going to update these to be j. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do a couple of things. One, I have a pointer to what I'm looking at. This current pointer represents Gary here. Okay, That's the green arrow. Inside this loop here, this other pointer represents the purple arrow here that I'm going to be moving around. They're both going to start pointing at Gary. So what I want to do is I want to ignore this. I want to ignore it if you are yourself. So if other is not equal to current, that's the first test I want to do. So I'm going through this list. I want to ignore Gary because I'm already looking at Gary. Then I want to look at John. I want to compare to see if John is colliding with Gary. Then what I want to do is, and we're going to ask Gary, are you colliding with John? I'm going to write this function called is colliding with. It's going to ask these two guys, hey, are your circles overlapping with one another? Okay. So let's write that function. And it's going to be a function that returns true or false. It's going to say is colliding with, and you're going to return, you're going to take in a pointer to the other object. This function is going to do the logic of comparing our radiuses with one another. We need to see if the, the, radii, the collision radius of this object that I'm currently in is colliding with the other object that I'm passing in as an argument. So if I go into the is colliding with function that I've now created here, we're going to say if my radius or my position And we're going to compare the radius, oh, sorry, I'm going to get my collision radius here, plus the other collision radius. We need to see if my position is within this collision radius, right? We need to see if my collision radius is overlapping at all, which means am I within, is my position from the center of my ship within the collision radius of the other? So we need to get the distance between me and these, the, the uh, center or the collision of the, uh, the radius of the other object. So what we're going to do is, let me draw this on a new diagram here. Here's how we're going to set this up.
So this is kind of the classic question of game development, right? You know that these two circles aren't overlapping with one another, but how do you know that they're not overlapping with one another? If I know that the radius of this thing is 10, and I know that the radius of this thing is 5, what is the behavior that I need to know to detect that these two guys aren't overlapping? Like, I can, you obviously can know when this circle is overlapping with another. Like, these two things are overlapping. But how do you know what determines that these two things are overlapping or not? Their radius? Their radiuses overlap, right? The distance, the, distance between the origins. Yeah. The distance between the origins is greater than or is, is the distance between the two centers of these greater than the sum of their radii, which means the radii here, 10 and 15. If the distance between these two guys is less than 15, that means that I'm intersecting, right? I note that the radius of the first guy is 10, radius of the second guy is 15. If the distance between these two points is less than 15, that means that they're overlapping. There's no way that the distance between these two guys can be less than 15 and not be having the circles overlap, okay? So what we need to do is we need to calculate the distance between these two and then compare it versus the collision radius of both. Okay? So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to get the distance between these two things. Remember, the distance is equal to what? You remember? Uh, it has nothing to do with radius at all. It's just based on position. Does anyone remember the... Uh, Wait, people are saying, John, what is it? Uh, x2 minus x1 mm -hmm. is, uh, y2 minus y1. Yes. Square yes. But you have to, you missed a, you missed a step too. It's actually going to be the, the distance is going to be the distance of those two things, the, the direction of those two things, the square root of the vector of those. So here, let's, let's calculate it. What we can do is we can calculate the, vector to other. Let me do this. Get position minus. So how do I get the size of this vector? Remember, we did this magnitude thing before. We actually are already doing it here. It's actually the square root of x squared plus y squared of the, the magnitude. So the distance here is going to be the Pythagorean theorem, remember? So if I go back to here, and let's say I just want to delete these two things. How do I get the distance between these two points? Well, I have this line that's drawn, right? This is the hypotenuse, right? Mm -hmm. There is a y component, right? And there's an x component. We actually know, we don't know this. This one is the thing we don't know. We do know this and this. How do we know what y and x are? How do we know what the this components are? Well, we just take the position of this guy and we subtract the position of this guy. And that gets us x and y along this triangle. Then what we can do is we can do the Pythagorean theorem, which is hypotenuse is equal to the square root x squared plus y squared, right? So we're going to take these two things because, remember, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, hypotenuse squared. So by doing that, we can calculate the distance between these two points. So I have my vector to other. This thing has an x and a y position. This is basically me calculating this guy right here, calculating this vector. I want to find out what this is. So I'm going to take this position, subtract it from this position. So distance is going to be equal to the square root of vector to other. It's going to be a squared plus b squared, not b, it's going to be y in this case. It's going to give us the distance, and then all we have to do is, if the distance is less than the combined radiuses of my collision radius and the other collision radius, that means we have 
a collision. And I'm just going to print that out to the screen when that happens. I'm going to do a printf when this happens with any game object here. Looks like we already have a bunch of collisions here. Like these asteroids are all overlapping. Let's see if we can get one that doesn't have asteroids overlapping. Okay, so no collision yet. So I'm going to shoot a bullet. So the bullet is actually colliding with a player still. So there's my, uh, as you guys can see. Isn't that when you fire, it already creates the... Yeah, because you know where the bullet's getting created from? Getting inside the player. So the player is colliding with the bullet, and the asteroids are all colliding with the bullet. We're, not, that's, we're okay with that. We're just going to say return true here, because we want the player to know that he's hitting a bullet. We just don't want him to do anything about it, right? So we're going to return true. What do we want to do in this case when we find out that we are colliding with? We're going to call this virtual function called, hey, you collided with this thing. We can just say collided with here. And by default, it's not going to do anything. The game objects don't care about this. But we do care about, let's say we want to have the player collide with something. Okay, we're going to write the player version first. Actually, let's do the, uh, let's do the bullet version first, because I'm going to leave the player one for homework. So bullet, he's going to get this function called collided with. So now if I go to my engine, we know that you're colliding with this other thing. We're going to say, hey dude, you collided with this thing, this other thing. So let's write this function for the bullet. We're going to write this function for the bullet. And when it collides with something, we're just going to destroy the other thing. Now, this is going to be a problem because we're going to destroy the player, too. But watch what happens. So I'm going to move this. Oh, the asteroids get blown up. Oh, it looks like the player doesn't care if he gets destroyed or not. We're going to have to fix that. But we're just destroying the other object. So let's change this a little bit here. I'm going to change this. I want to make sure the player also gets destroyed. I think it has more to do with the player's update. Here. Actually, you know what? The uh, Let's do a couple things first. Let's also destroy ourselves here. Because we want the bullet destroyed. Yeah. And then what we're going to do is we're going to not only have the... I, don't, I really don't want the, uh, the player here to be destroyed. But I want to show you guys what happens when that when that occurs here. I'm gonna do here. Oh, so you did it right? Yes. This yeah. is this is actually I uh, this he should be destroyed. Yes, he is destroyed. Ah, uh, he still has a pointer. Still have a player pointer here. Okay. Let's just see what happens. He should be getting destroyed here. I'm not. Re I can't recall why. Oh, he's happy to fly. Did I create a second player? Let me think about this for a second. Okay, we'll have to work work on this. You guys can watch me a little bit here, and watch me debug this issue. So I'm expecting the player to get destroyed because he's actually. He's actually getting hit by the bullet, and he is getting told to be destroyed. However, he doesn't care. So <laughs> we're going to make sure that he cares about getting destroyed. Let's see here. Let me just make sure that the player actually exists as I expect him to. Cool. And he is destroyed. The current here. You can see all the asteroids are getting destroyed properly as well. And the bullets are getting destroyed too. 
Ah, I know how to debug this. We're going to actually just do this. Right, get rid of these. I'm going to blow up the player by shooting a bullet, and then we're going to put a breakpoint here. It looks like there's two players in here. I want to make sure the player is getting destroyed, so we're going to put a breakpoint here. Oh, you know what? I think I might be passing in the wrong other. Yeah, if other's not equal to current j, j is equal to zero, other is player, current collided with other. He is destroyed. And then down here, I think my loop is wrong. Ah, that's why. This is a this is an interesting bug because the destruction call is actually incorrect here. This is one of those bugs that is off by one, and the reason is that this should be greater than or equal to zero. So the problem here is that anything that was added first doesn't get considered for destruction. So we were getting through this list, and its i was equal to one, and never being equal to zero, which means that the player who was at zero was never being considered for destruction. So the player was effectively invulnerable, which is not good. So now when I shoot myself, the player dies and the bullet keeps going. That's, that's the behavior I wanted. So I'm glad we got to fix that. <laughs> So now it has more of the behavior that I want it, which is now when I shoot the thing, it kills my player, which is what it should have been doing the whole time. Um, okay, cool. But how do we prevent that? Now that's, that's great. Like, <laughs> <laughs> now how do we get it back to what it was doing, which is I want to shoot the asteroid and not the player, because this is just blowing up everything. How do you tell whether... What's that? Get rid of the oh, get rid of that? That'll fix it for real? It won't actually fix it because, like, watch what I can actually. It'll actually still break it. It just means that whatever gets added first doesn't break. So watch. I'm just gonna move the player to be added later. I put. I got rid of the equal sign, and the uh, the player still gets blown up. But now one of these asteroids is invulnerable. That's that's the that's the nature of the bug. So if I shoot, I don't know which one of these asteroids is invulnerable. But the problem is not really with the equals. The problem is because when you tell the bullet to destroy something, it doesn't care. It's it, it actually just destroys everything, right? How do we know that we want to not destroy the player? How do we know that this thing is a player or not? Well, there's a special, um, a special function in C++ that you can call to ask for what type of object something is. You can actually, hey, uh, you can actually do something to ask this other thing, hey, are you the player or not? There's this thing called a dynamic cast and dynamic cast will try to turn this pointer, which is a game object, into a player. If it is a player, this thing will be valid and not null. If this thing is like an asteroid, this pointer will be null instead. So watch. I'm going to add this behavior here, and I'm going to put a breakpoint right here when I shoot. Okay? So this other thing that's being passed in, if you guys can see, it actually is a player. You can see that pointer to a player. That means it is a player. So I'm going to try to convert this other object into a player, and I succeed. This pointer that I created on the stack, the player, is actually valid. It's pointing to a valid memory address. So now my if statement here says, OK, you can safely, oops, what I want to do is I want to make this thing, if it's equal to null, I want to destroy it. Only if this is not a player do I want to blow it up. So I'm going to shoot my bullet. This thing is a player. So I'm going to skip this behavior. I'm not going to destroy the other object. So I'm going to continue on, and I'm going to shoot this asteroid now. So I get, what is this thing that I'm hitting right now? This is still a player. You can see player other. So I can do this. I need to get rid of this breakpoint here. Shoot the uh, asteroid. So you can see the asteroid is actually being hit by the bullet right now. The pink, the magenta collision radiuses are overlapping with one another. So now when I have this other object, 
This other object is actually, it's actually an asteroid here. I don't know what this thing is. Get rid of that. This thing that I collided with is actually an asteroid. You guys can see here. So when I cast it to a player, look at my player pointer, it's null. Because this dynamic cast failed to cast the asteroid into a player because they aren't related. They're, the same, they're derived from the same class. However, dynamic cast will only succeed if the object is of that type or is, a, is, a derived, is derived from that type. So in this case, asteroid is not derived from asteroid or derived from player, and it's neither a player itself. So the player pointer goes null. Which means that my if statement now says, cool, it's not a player, you're allowed to blow it up. Now when I shoot my bullets, I can blow up these asteroids. Okay. I also want my bullets themselves to be destroyed, so we're actually just going to call destroy on our own object. Look at these two function calls, they look the same, right? This one, though, is destroying the thing that I hit, and this one is destroying me. There's an implicit thing that gets happened when you call destroy and you don't put anything on the left side of it. It actually puts what's called the this pointer. This is actually what's being called. It's saying destroy this, and this one's saying destroy the other thing, too. But this is implied, so you don't actually have to put that in there all the time. But now I'm destroying both the bullet and the asteroids, so when I shoot this thing, both of them go away. <laughs> Now we have the basic behavior for our Asteroids game, right? We can test this out too. We can add like... It'll work no matter how many you have. Right? And we can get rid of these magenta circles by just commenting out the code that draws them inside the game object. Comment out this line right here. Now there is some weird stuff that's happening. Watch what happens when I get into the middle of a bunch of these. And one bullet is going to actually destroy multiple asteroids. Can you, do you guys know why that's happening? Like if I put them all in the same spot? Because that one bullet is colliding with multiple objects at the same moment. Yeah, even though, you're right. Even though that bullet's destroyed, it doesn't care. It's allowed to continue piercing the other bullets, the other asteroids. Watch what happens when I stack a bunch of asteroids on top of one another. I can clear out all of these just by shooting. I want each bullet to only be able to blow up one asteroid. Right? So here I am blowing up all these asteroids with one, with one bullet. So how do we fix that? Well, we know that we talked about before, if, if something dies, we want it to not be considered for collision detection anymore. We want to put this little star next to them. right? So we are doing that already. Now our engine, though, needs to care about whether an object is destroyed or not. So going back to the game engine, Oops. Going back to our game engine. We have our collision detection here. What we want to do is we want to also test other is destroyed. We want to make sure he's not destroyed. And we want to make sure the current thing is not destroyed either. By t adding these two checks here, now we verify that neither of these two things are already on their way out to getting blown up. So now when I shoot, oops, I missed it up. Others not destroyed here. Only if they're, neither of them are destroyed, will you care? So now I want to shoot my bullets. I'm actually blowing stuff up, but it's only, it's only blowing one up at a time. You can see here that even though I'm inside here and I'm shooting, taking a while, but it's as if I'm shooting these things one at a time. Okay. Now you can make a bullet type that doesn't kill itself, right? You can easily make like a piercing bullet type. This might be one of the things you might want to try to improve upon. Maybe you make a special derived type of bullet, for instance, that is a special bullet that doesn't destroy itself when it collides with other objects. For instance, if I just comment out this line of code, for instance, one that kills itself, one bullet will actually pierce through and kill all of these things, right? It's almost like a mining torpedo. Mm -hmm. It's kind of neat. You can make a version of this bullet that does that. 
That's the power of object-oriented programming, is I can make a bullet that does everything the same, like so. Super bullet. The only difference is that the collided with function is going to do a little something different. We're going to take this collided with function and we're going to just destroy the other thing. So I'm going to have both regular bullets and super bullets. And then my player, when I press spacebar, it's going to spawn the regular bullets. But when I spawn control, Going to spawn a super bullet. And my super bullet is going to be derived from a bullet. So by deriving a super bullet from a bullet, I also need to create a constructor for this bullet, for the super bullet. I can, I can share all the same functionality of what a bullet does, the only difference being that my super bullet, this is my regular bullets, and I fire a super bullet and it goes through everything. And my weapon cooldown is really, really long right now, like I'm holding spacebar right now and I shoot one super bullet. Let's see here, I missed. Shoot one super bullet here, and I can clear everything. So now I have a bullet that's special. I can make more of these things, right? I can make a bullet that's like really big. Maybe this bullet, by default, when it's spawned, right? And I can set the collision radius to be like 60. Now my super bullet is much bigger. Without me changing a lot of code, I get this like huge thing that spins around and it acts exactly the same as a bullet. Like it goes off the edge of the screen and everything, right? But now when I fire this thing, it's like a big bomb. I could even do things like uh, change the color of it. I still have all my regular bullets. I'm not changing my code here, right? I can also change the speed of these bullets. Maybe my super bullet is like really slow. But, but now, I don't have to touch the code for bullet at all. Okay. All right, so that's how we make a bullet. So what I want to do next is I want to give you guys one, one more thing to do in class, if you have time for it in class, which is when I blow up an asteroid, I want this asteroid to break apart into smaller asteroids. Okay. Let me uh, change these asteroids so that they, uh, let me give you guys this, this lab on Zool as well, because you're going to use it for homework. And I, I can give you this for homework as well. Super bullet. You can create as many as you want. I'll just make 50 and I'll put this up on Zool right now. So the lab I want you to do is I want you to spawn uh, five moving asteroids that move in random directions. Oh, I didn't do that yet. Let me do that too in class. And then when shooting an asteroid, I want you to make uh, those asteroids break into smaller pieces and I want you to make those smaller pieces move apart in random directions. Okay. So let's make these asteroids move as well. That's pretty straightforward. We can just say, hey, asteroid set velocity. And we just pick a SF vector 2F. Pick a random direction. Uh, let's do minimum 50 plus rand uh, modulo 100. And then we're going to set the rander for the velocity so they'll move. And we're also going to make them rotate too. 
they're all moving down to the right. Cool. And they'll have, oh, they have drag applied to them. We don't want that either. <laughs> We're going to want to get rid of that too. So here's how you get rid of drag. You grab the apply drag function, you put it into the asteroid, and you just put this at the end of it. So now they'll move forever. Notice though that everything derives off game objects. So these asteroids are going to go and show up on the other side of the screen too. I want these things to kind of go randomly in all directions too. So what I'm going to do is I want to rotate this by some random angle. So let's see here. Asteroid, set angle, rand, modulo 360. And then we're going to set the velocity B rand 100 plus 50. I'm just rotating them first, and then I'm setting a velocity. There's a velocity function here that doesn't take a, uh, a direction. It just takes an amount. That takes the angle and sets that. There's all my, my asteroids are a little too fast, so we'll slow them down. And let's also make it so that they rotate over time. So we're going to make the asteroids rotate just like the bullets rotate by adding an update function here. And we're going to create this function. And inside this function, we're going to call game object update. Make sure to do that so that the game object itself gets a chance to update it. And then we're going to set m angle plus equal to, I don't know, 180 times dt. By just updating m angle, these things are going to spin 180 degrees every second, and I still have my super bullet. With just a little bit of code, we can get all these things moving around, right? Okay. So what I want to have happen is I want to, when I blow up these asteroids, they have a chance to destroy, uh, spawn new asteroids. So here's what you're going to have to do. There is this function called destroy that lives on the base object. We're going to make this thing virtual. What I want you to do is take this virtual function right here, and I want you to do, create a version of it inside large asteroid here that does something, right? So that's what I w I'm going to have you guys do. I want you to implement this destroy function inside the large asteroid. Making sure to remember to call the base version of destroy as well. Otherwise, your asteroid itself won't blow up when you actually call destroy on it. When I say call the base version, I mean do something like this. You're going to call like the base version, you're going to call game object destroy in your version of the function. All right. Let me put this up on Zool. Oh, and let me show you guys the homework as well. Because if you guys need to head out, you can do this. But I want this for, you're going to need this for homework. The homework is actually a little bit straightforward. Like it's a little bit, um, it's not anything too crazy different from what we have. I just want the player, when he collides with the asteroid, to blow up. Let me see if I can open this thing. And I want you to add the concept of a medium-sized asteroid, okay? Oh, and the asteroid rotation, I want you to also change it so that it's either 45 to 90 degrees per second clockwise or minus 45 to minus 90 degrees clown. So I want some of them to spin in the other direction as well. And then the concept of a medium asteroid, so some of these asteroids are middle-sized. And the rules are blowing up a large one creates three medium, and blowing up a medium one creates two small ones. And then, if the asteroids actually collide with the player, I want you to destroy the player ship and print game over or you lose onto the screen. Keep in mind that the way it's set up right now, sometimes when you play the game, you'll actually spawn on top of an asteroid. So we'll solve this next week with this mechanic, which is the player, when he spawns, will get a force field around him, which prevents him from dying. But I want you to make it so that these asteroids here in our game, it's okay if they spawn on top of the player, but I would have died immediately here. So you might want to like reduce the number of asteroids you actually spawn as well. So Mercy's ability. Mercy, but yeah, he's invulnerable while he's spawning. Yeah, exactly. So let me put this up on Zool. This is the updated version of it. I'm gonna delete. I'm gonna delete the one that's up there right now. I'm gonna give you guys everything. Oh, the super bullet is in there too. It's um, it's on left control right now. Why is this thing not being uh, updated? Who has this file open? Weird. Someone have this SDVA engine file. Hey, AJ. <laughs> he still has it open though. Somewhere. 
Right, let me rename this folder so you guys can at least get it. He's not even here and he's still going to. All right, there's a new folder called new SDV engine, which I'm copying right now. That'll hopefully uh, get it get it to you guys.